Hello, everybody. So um, I'm Dr. Susan Schneider, and I'm the director of the FAU Center for the Future Mind, which is a new center that was founded this semester. Um, so I'm pleased to launch our new book salon series, and Bernie Bars is our first guest. So let me tell you a little bit about Bernie. Um, so we have a very distinguished first speaker. Um, Bernie is best known as the originator of the global workspace theory of consciousness. Um, he's a former senior fellow in theoretical neurobiology at the Neurosciences Institute in La Jolla, California. He's currently editor in chief of the Society for Mind Brain Sciences. And he co-founded the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness and the academic press journal, Consciousness and Cognition. He's also the recipient of the International Neural Network Society 2019 Hermann von Helmholtz Award, recognizing scientific life contributions proven to be paradigm changing, demonstrating outstanding research achievements in perception. Now this salon is on his recent book. I hate to use the word, the expression magnum opus, but it looks to me like one. Um, it, it's just an amazing read. I've been having so much fun with it. Um, on consciousness, science, and subjectivity. And just, I thought the best way to say a few things about the book is just to read what other people have said. Um, for example, Daniel Dennett says that um, for those who want to join the race to model consciousness, this is the starting line, okay? And Murray Shanahan writes, the updated works of Bernard Bars collected here are among the foundational texts of the scientific study of consciousness. Their influence in cognitive science and philosophy of mind is enormous and their impact on my own thinking has been profound. So I'm excited to give the floor to Bernie and um, what we're gonna do is start out um, with a 15, 20 minute elaboration of the global workspace theory of consciousness followed by a sort of question and answer session between Bernie and myself designed to tease out certain facets of the book. And then we're gonna open it up to questions. Okay, let's get started. Great, thank you. Let me get my, get my voice into gear here. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I think the idea of a, a center for the future of mind, if I've got that correctly, uh, I think that's a wonderful idea and is much needed today when people are so confused about the difference between consciousness, which is a great biological adaptation uh, that fills 80% of our heads, right? Uh, uh, oh, sorry, talk, I'm talking about the cerebral cortex here, which is the organ of consciousness that fills 80% of our heads. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, uh, a very preliminary, very early beginning of an understanding, I think. But, uh, but it's an amazing thing to me because this all started uh, when consciousness as a scientific topic did not even exist. So that's my original world. Uh, and I still live in that world because it's a, uh, it's it's a dangerous consciousness is is a swamp, um, and we we need to put little you know little stones down in this swamp to go step by step by step, uh, and my personal approach has been purely empirical, uh, and I would like to say that right at the beginning. Uh, because I think people who try to wander through the swamp without a, a lot of solid grounding uh, are usually never seen again. And in Florida, uh, <laughs> you know what happens to them very likely, but we don't know because we just never see anything again. So thank you, Susan, and uh, let's go for it. Wonderful. So Bernie, my understanding is that you're going to present some slides on the global workspace theory to give the audience the background. Is that right? You want yes, to get that's the there? plan. That's perfect. And the swamp analogy is lovely. And hopefully we can dodge any alligators today. All right. Uh, 
Are we, uh, uh, oh, Andrew, uh, would you show the first slide? There we go. So the title is how to study consciousness without losing your mind. Uh, and this is, uh, I suppose, a little jokey, but it's also serious because it is simply unbelievable uh, how many very intelligent, very well educated, very well meaning uh, people wander into the swamp uh, and, uh, and they don't have constraints. And as we know in science and mathematics, uh, the first thing you do is look for constraints because you know perfectly well that if that your journey, if it is not safe, if it's not kept constrained in some way, uh, it is going to end in, you know, being eaten by the alligators. Uh, and, and so I just want you to think of this as essentially an empirical journey that then benefited from Alan Newell's work in artificial intelligence and any number of other uh, really extraordinary people in artificial intelligence and now mathematics uh, who also bring things to the table that are really important. And because it's empirical, uh, we start with an operational definition. Uh, consciousness for our purposes is anything that people can report accurately. Uh, and, and very often the, the great traditional way of uh, doing this is, uh, was developed 200 years ago, right around nine, 1800, with the beginning of the sensory sciences in what's called sensory psychophysics. And every electronic gadget that we now use little screens, uh, little headphones and so on, everything, the little vibratory surfaces, uh, everything uh, is engineered according to 200 years of first rate science uh, on the conscious senses. So uh, this is both solidly scientific. It's also very, very practical because we're using it every single day. So, uh, slide number two, please. And you may recognize these characters. Uh, and I'm starting with the public health advisory as we all are doing these days. If this topic makes you feel nervous, please regulate your breathing by counting to four uh, silently. Uh, and you'll see that feels a lot better right away. So. Ah, take, take a deep breath. And of course, we're looking at Plato and Aristotle in this magnificent Renaissance painting by Raphael, uh, which hangs in the Vatican, uh, oddly enough, uh, even though it has all kinds of uh, 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 non-Vatican uh, themes, uh, as you might uh, consider it, because the Renaissance Italians, of course, simply worshipped uh, classical Greece and the two great voices about the human mind, which is always the conscious mind, historically. The unconscious mind is a very recent idea, and we'll talk about that, of course. But uh, for most cultures in history, for most great civilizations, when people talked about the mind, they meant they imagined a, a conscious mind. And Aristotle on the left-hand side, who is older, uh, is pointing to the heavens, which is the realm of Platonic ideas, uh, which is a, an idea that has been adopted by religious traditions as being compatible with that, although we do not really know uh, what Plato's beliefs were in regard to conventional, what we call conventional religion. And then Aristotle to his right, who was, who was Plato's uh, pupil uh, and who wrote the 40 books that we still have from that time, absolutely magnificent 
books. And the most famous one for our purposes is called On the Psyche. Uh, and the word psyche, by the word psyche, uh, a modern linguistic scholar who has translated it and studied its original meaning, uh, with the word psyche, uh, Aristotle really meant the conscious psyche. And as a very great scientist, he was a naturalistic philosopher, which is the same as a scientist today, as a very, very great scientist and founder uh, of the field of consciousness science from a Western point of view. Uh, he, he told us basically uh, what everybody took to be true for uh, about two and a half millennia. Uh, so uh, both of these characters are important and uh, they should be reassuring to us that we are not the first uh, to try to wander into this swamp, um, uh, but we are the, uh, the, uh, the, the grateful recipients of uh, many uh, wonderful ancient civilizations that have tell us uh, uh, an enormous amount about consciousness, although not perhaps uh, what is publishable today. So uh, uh, the next slide, please. So this is an article that uh, Jerry Edelman, Joe Galli and I uh, published in 2011 uh, called the Biology of Consciousness uh, in, um, uh, in Frontiers in Psychology. Uh, and it lays out uh, really uh, the the the, the convergence of two uh, very long uh, and very intelligent traditions uh, in the work that we were doing together. Jerry Edelman uh, was a very great uh, uh, Nobelist uh, who received his Nobel Prize in Medicine uh, by solving uh, the earliest in the 1970s, uh, solving the problem of uh, immune molecular receptors, which live in the, uh, in the membranes uh, of our uh, immune cells. Joe Galley was his first graduate student. Uh, I was his last graduate student, perhaps, um, or at least I I'm, I'm, can identify with that tradition, but actually uh, I also owe uh, everything to Alan Newell in artificial intelligence and a great series of uh, scientific psychologists who uh, I was privileged to learn from. Uh, th so that's uh, that was uh, 2021, and I don't know if anybody remembers the, uh, the 20th century, uh, which was a while ago. Uh, some of you may remember the 20th century. Uh, and in 1983, uh, I published uh, a chapter uh, in a book that was called Conscious Contents Provide the Nervous System with Coherent Global Information. Uh, that article was basically the seed of everything else I've done since that time. And it was based purely on the evidence that we had in 1983. So this is a very, very long and cumulative tradition of reliable uh, evidence. And then on the bottom, of course, we have Alan Newell's great work uh, uh, called Unified Theories of Cognition. Uh, Newell was a great pioneer in computer science, uh, but of course he was also a great pioneer in, in what is sometimes called the cognitive architecture uh, tradition and, and global workspace theory in its various incarnations uh, is essentially uh, another global architecture. It's not a complete global architecture the way I have presented it because I have focused on only a part uh, of the available huge literature by now. Uh, Stan Franklin, my old buddy uh, uh, from Memphis, um, University of Memphis, uh, has expanded global workspace theory in one of its uh, artificial intelligence incarnation uh, in a system called LIDA. Uh, and it all really started with uh, the uh, group that Newell led at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, and which essentially is expressed in his unified theories of cognition. 
uh, with what was called the hearsay architecture. Uh, and what's interesting to us, uh, there are many interesting thing about the, uh, things about the hearsay architecture. It was really a demonstration of global workspace uh, ideas, computational ideas, but really also practical ideas, because biology also has its computational side, as you all know. Uh, and the important thing about uh, hearsay uh, was that it solved an impossible problem. Uh, I was uh, doing psychology of language uh, at that time, and one of my teachers, uh, Jim Jenkins, a uh, very, very great uh, person in, in uh, cognitive psychology of the time. Uh, uh, Jim told me that he didn't think the speech perception problem uh, would be solved uh, uh, in, uh, for another 50 years. It was just too complex. There were too many ways of interpreting the acoustical signal as a, after it bounced around a standard room and got absorbed by human bodies and by couches and got bounced off glass uh, windows and so on. Uh, and the answer was a kind of charade uh, model uh, of uh, a computation, uh, charades being a, a game, uh, a word game, uh, in which a, half a dozen people sit around a room uh, and somebody uh, presents a set of cues and they're not strong cues, so people really have to think very hard and guess. Uh, and the various participants uh, who do not know the answer they're half ignorant because that's the whole point. Uh, at that time in, 19, uh, in 1990, uh, we were certainly half ignorant about the problem of speech perception. Uh, and Alan and his team at that time uh, uh, did an, a kind of analogy of the game of charades, uh, where the participants uh, were called knowledge sources, but they were very, very imperfect. Uh, we didn't have uh, what's called formant tracking, which is a more modern way of doing speech analysis and works nicely. Uh, but the computers we had at that time were not as powerful. The algorithms were not particularly well worked out by modern standards. Uh, but the key thing was to have these half ignorant knowledge sources competing, cooperating, and above all, communicating to solve problems that none of the participants could solve by himself or herself. And that's the key insight uh, in global workspace theory. And it is important that this is practical because biology cares about practical. Uh, biology has lots of profound uh, theoretical ideas uh, that are involved with it and which show us a different world from the conventional world of classical mathematics, for example. Uh, biology has different ways of operating that have been studied, as you know, uh, in recent uh, decades in very revealing ways that have had very practical consequences in terms of uh, uh, deep learning and, and massive parallel interactive information processing. Um, and a lot of these things go back to Newell's work on hearsay. Uh, so the key idea is that uh, it's kind of the wisdom of markets. If you put a lot of smart people together, but with very incomplete information, uh, then uh, somewhere along the line, uh, if you can uh, have a bulletin board or a blackboard or a global workspace on which anybody can post their guesses about the answer, uh, then others can say, no, 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 that's wrong, or yes, I agree. So you can vote for the, the current posted uh, hypothesis about the incoming sound uh, and people cooperate, they compete fiercely. And, but the essential thing about a global workspace architecture is that people have to communicate with each other. So we make each other 
more adaptable, uh, more intelligent, perhaps, uh, and more able to predict something that none of us as individuals could predict. And that's the basic idea. So next slide, please. And here are your ancestors and mine. Uh, and this is from an old movie, which is quite wonderful, uh, called The Search for Fire, The Quest for Fire. Uh, and uh, these people are being chased uh, by a very stubborn and determined looking uh, lion, which is quite realistic about our ancestors. Uh, and these people are running through what looks like an open, hillside. Uh, and that is, of course, the, the African veldt, uh, the, the ecosystem that humans, in which humans emerged uh, about two million years ago as bipedal uh, and uh, tool-making, uh, hands-using um, creatures, uh, which are formerly called Homo habilis, and Homo erectus, and I think there's an ongoing debate within uh, paleoanthropology uh, about you know, whether Homo erectus can be proven to be the same as Homo habilis, but I'm fortunately not an anthropologist uh, or an archeologist. So I can say, yes, I'll bet you that those things evolved at the same time. People got started to walk on their hind legs and about the same time, they liberated both their chests for breathing uh, and also their hands and arms for tool making. Uh, human beings are tool makers, uh, and we do not know exactly how far that goes back. But the current evidence, I think, shows that uh, we've been tool makers for something on the order of a million years or so. Uh, and the kinds of tools that we made, of course, were the kinds of tools that hunters and foragers needed to survive. And the other thing we did, uh, because we are rather small bodied, uh, but pretty fierce uh, uh, critters. Uh, the other thing we did is because we can't individually survive the attack of a lion uh, or any other serious predator uh, in Africa, uh, we banded together in small groups, uh, very much like the canids did. The canids are, are the dog-like species in the world, and there are many of them, uh, but most of them, I believe at least, uh, are pack hunters. Uh, and we therefore have to be very social and very intelligent as well, and very communicative, because we have to make sure that uh, if we are the alpha male uh, or the alpha female uh, in the family, most of them were family members because that's genetically how people get to know each other. So there are these wolf packs, uh, ancient wolf packs, ancient uh, ancestral uh, canids, uh, canines, uh, but they're called canids right now for technical reasons in biology. Uh, and so, uh, so the, the alpha animal has to have street cred, uh, and you only keep street cred as long as you can figure out where the prey animal is to be found and is to be hunted and slaughtered. Um, and eventually cooked and eaten. Uh, that's a major ingredient in human evolution for the last uh, two million years, which is about the ancestry of the genus Homo. Uh, and that's us uh, looking handsome and cute, as you can tell. Uh, and, uh, and very intimidating by waving spears and screaming. We also scream because we're afraid. Uh, and sometimes you can't tell the difference. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, life, uh, uh, life on Earth uh, is absolutely chock full of ambiguities. 
And that is something which you and I may not understand. One very obvious domain of ambiguity is the domain of words. So if I use the word bit for all of you today, uh, you're going to interpret the word bit uh, in a particular way, given the context uh, that we've got here. Uh, but go back a hundred years and what do you think, and I'm seriously answer, asking everybody this question, what do you think the bit probably meant to most people at that time? Any, any uh, good guesses? Uh, I, I don't know if we're, we're set up to, to do a Q&A right now, so I'm just going to leave you with that uh, because it's a good question. It's a good question, and I'm not going to answer it uh, because I don't know the answer for one thing, but also because uh, a bit is like all the other common words in English. Uh, it is highly ambiguous. And when you ask a question, as I just did, out of any particular context, uh, then you can think of a number of uh, meanings uh, and uh, syntactic roles and so on uh, of the word bit. Um, so uh, my claim is therefore that uh, resolving ambiguities that surround us, and they're both internal, they, uh, we get ambiguous signals from the body as people in medicine have long understood, uh, if you feel some uh, pain in the body, for example, it is very often referred from its actual origin in tissue damage uh, to uh, another place in the body. So we think we have a, a, a pain in our left arms, uh, and in fact, it's coming from another part of the body. That's an ambiguity. Uh, the life, as a cat stalking through grass is filled with ambiguities and even changing ambiguities from moment to moment as the cat stalks very carefully uh, through the grass uh, in order to find its prey and it must find its prey or it will die. So resolving ambiguities must be a major Darwinian survival and reproductive challenge and it has to be one that repeats over and over again. So you and I uh, can wonder about the meaning of the word bit because we are language using creatures with pretty large vocabularies. Uh, but uh, prior to the emergence of spoken language, which is guessed to be about 200,000 years, uh, but that's only a guess. It's, uh, my guess is that it's actually much earlier, but that's a guess too. Uh, so, uh, but the point is that ambiguities were encountered by hominids and by earlier ancestors, pre-hominid ancestors, uh, every day. Uh, one ambiguity after another. And you can just imagine what it was like living in uh, arboreal lives uh, as um, as ho hominoid uh, apes, uh, human-like uh, uh, tree dwellers, and that was before two million years ago in Africa. Uh, and after that, we became bush and field uh, dwellers, and that had to be a challenge that we had to surmount time and time again, uh, so that you and I uh, like to wander around uh, green bushes and lush fields, uh, it's very pleasant, very peaceful. Uh, but this cat can only hunt in the tall grass by pre-consciously, and that's important, let's call it by unconsciously resolving visual ambiguities before the sight of a mouse scurrying away and diving into a, a hole in the ground, before that sight, which is a conscious and coherent, self-consistent percept uh, before that percept can appear in the mind, in the brain of the cat. Uh, and we know with near certainty that that occurs in visual cortex uh, for the cat, but it also involves uh, a lot of other places uh, in cortex 
and some uh, outside of cortex as well. I'm going to be talking mainly about cortex uh, in this talk because it is the organ of conscious mentation, uh, which is actually a quote from one of my heroes, the great surgeon uh, Wilder Penfield, who worked on human beings who were epileptic. This is before we had any brain mapping equipment to speak of. And so at that time, surgeons working on very seriously ill ep epileptics had to open the brain, open a flap in the skull, be sure it was still vascularized and living and all that good stuff, uh, inject a local anesthetic around the edges of the flap and keep the patient awake and happy by talking to the patient. Uh, there's, no fit, there's no pain to be felt by probing the brain, uh, not that part of cortex in any case. Uh, so there was, this was a painless situation where uh, ultimately 1,200 epileptic patients were studied surgically uh, over a 30-year period by Penfield and his colleagues at the Montreal Neurological Institute. Uh, and this is a fantastic uh, archive of evidence that is now being built on because the operation uh, is still being performed for epileptics who cannot be cured by medicines alone. So this is not your first line of treatment. You don't just open people's brains up and see what you can find. But it was enormously important and 1,200 patients over 30 years, uh, Penfield and his team uh, learned a great deal uh, that we tend to think of as modern discoveries, and they are modern discoveries because now we can verify all of that. But the basic evidence comes from the surgical series at the Montreal Neurological Institute. Uh, now, and, and here is a cat who has a brain very much like ours. Uh, it's a smaller version, uh, but cats are brainy creatures. Uh, this one looks very alert, at least to my eyes. Uh, and probably stalking very, very quietly in such a way as to maintain its posture, the height of its head and eyes and so on. And that's important because you need a stable platform from which to use your eyes. And the cat is at the same time sniffing, of course, breathing in molecules. Uh, it looks like it has its ears pricked up uh, and it can therefore use binocular integration uh, from two points to uh, two outer ears, uh, the pinnae, uh, as they are called, uh, to spot a single coherent integrated percept, namely a running mouse that may be a yard away, for example. And the only way for the cat to, to accomplish this biologically is to take in quite ambiguous fragments of information to, to go fixation by fixation, just like you and I do when we are reading what you may be reading right now. You go fix by fix by fix, uh, let's say about 100 milliseconds per fixation. That's the conscious moment in reading and in seeing. And then we jump the eye, we literally twirl the eye the way you would twirl a billiard ball in a, in a pocket uh, of the billiard table. Uh, the eye, that's a saccad, uh, a jump, and the saccad is pretty good. It gets it close to the target, but not entirely at the target. And then the six powerful muscles surrounding the two eyes make finer adjustments and, and go uh, feedback loop uh, into the target itself. Uh, foveally, the most uh, high resolution part of the both, both eyes is only about two to four degrees of visual arc. It's about the size of two fingers. If you hold up two fingers at arm's length, 
that's about the size of the fovea. So the high resolution ability of our eyes is, is quite small. It's only a small patch of the visual world. Then we jump from fixation to fixation uh, and our wonderful cortex fills in the rest. Uh, the information that actually comes into the fovea is therefore very fragmentary. It's full of ambiguities, local ambiguities. Uh, these ambiguities have to be resolved by prior knowledge, which the cat has a great deal of, uh, and also by uh, learning at the very moment that the cat is stalking and beginning to see the first inklings uh, of that running mouse. It's a very difficult task, uh, and it has to be done with both top-down and bottom-up processing. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the organ of consciousness. Uh, the technical term is it's the corticothalamic complex or corticothalamic system, uh, some call, sometimes called thalamocortical. Uh, but the scientists who did the best research on this, that I know at least, uh, Mircea steriad uh, in animals, uh, preferred the, uh, to call it the corticothalamic because he thought, and he was quite right about this, uh, that the signal generally starts within the cortex and cycles down to the corresponding nucleus of the thalamus, which is thalam thalamic nuclei look like little bumps, little nuts uh, or, or beans, uh, but in fact they are cortex. Uh, they're just little pieces of cortex that are folded over uh, like a layer cake. There are six layers within the visual and the auditory uh, thalamic nucleus. And what you see here is a kind of reconstruction uh, based on biological evidence about neurons in the cortex. Uh, and you can kind of see how the major pathways, neuronal pathways, radiate out or appear to radiate out from the thalamus. Uh, as it turns out, uh, they're not exactly, they, they're anatomically radiating outward and that's what they usually are called in medicine. They're, they're cortical radiations of the sensory input. Uh, but what's really going on at the neuronal level is bidirectional signaling. And that is a very important uh, insight that uh, drives my friends who are engineers, drives them nuts because they're taught, of course, they've learned uh, that excitatory feedback is gonna blow up your, uh, your microphone and loudspeaker circuit. You put that microphone next to a loudspeaker and just the tiniest little uh, noise, uh, noisy uh, air movements at the microphone are going to be amplified by the loudspeaker, which is going to be re-amplified by the microphone and so on. It's a positive feedback loop and it's a formula for a disaster. Uh, so most systems that, uh, well, in fact, they're not systems. Most positive feedback loop destroy the systems they are part of. And so engineers, uh, quite rightly, learn how to regulate positive feedback loops. Uh, with circuit breakers and stuff like that. Uh, somehow, in a very puzzling way, uh, biology has worked out a way to allow this enormous organ to run on a trajectory that is near catastrophe, uh, but only near catastrophe because the cortex is generally extremely stable during waking consciousness. It does break down, uh, it's, connect it's, it's signaling, it does break down in epileptic seizures, uh, which is one reason why epileptic seizures are, are so important uh, because they are failures, uh, they're predictable failures uh, of a system that consists of an immense, about a hundred million neurons with about a quarter of a quadrillion uh, synapses by recent estimates. Uh, and you've got this whole thing essentially consisting of excitatory feedback loops, 
They are clutomaturgic, uh, so they're excitatory, they're long, uh, they tend to have long axons and dendrites. Uh, and so this is a very dangerous adaptation that somehow biological evolution and individual human development, because the, the cortex also develops from quite early on in gestation uh, to the, the, the rest of life really, uh, so very early on, uh, we have this cortex learning how to operate in a stable way. And if you can find the answer to that, uh, you can get a Nobel Prize. And next, please. And here's another uh, and better uh, view uh, of the relationships between the thalamus and the cortex. And this is the cortico-thalamic system. And I should mention, by the way, that the thalamus even today is not completely understood. We are obviously learning much, much more about it. But traditionally, uh, before people had uh, instruments uh, like uh, diffuse um, diffuse uh, fMRI, for example, which allows you to trace the oxygen molecules as they flow through uh, neurons and also uh, through blood vessels and so on. Uh, and this allows us to get to the connectome, uh, of course. But before that time, before that high technology was available, uh, people did not have a good understanding of thalamus. I do not know at this point whether we have a half decent understanding of the thalamus, but obviously we know two nuclei, two small uh, nuclei that look like bumps on an egg, um, which is the lateral geniculate uh, nucleus and the medial geniculus, geniculate uh, nucleus, both of them for vision and audition uh, respectively. Uh, and this is a system that we know without doubt by now uh, supports a conscious, the conscious senses. Uh, next, please. And so the cortex, uh, as you know, has any number of highly specialized local regions and it, uh, a current line of thinking is that this may be a kind of multi-scale specialization so that sometimes individual neurons have specialized roles but then little tiny local networks uh, also have their own roles uh, and cortical columns have their specialized roles and then patches of cortical columns, which are technically called blobs, uh, also have their local roles. And that was known already um, uh, around 1900 when microscopists who stared into, into light uh, microscopes basically, uh, figured out that there was a histological differences uh, uh, between the local uh, neuronal patches uh, of the cortex. And that was a well-known fact, but totally uninterpretable for perhaps a hundred years until recently we started to understand how uh, cortical specializations work. The major point to take away here is that cortical specializations are kind of uh, fractal, fractal in, in nature, using the word fractal, fractal as, as a, a metaphor, I'm not, math, not, not mathematically, um, but there, the, the functionality of cortex is both at the level of hemispheres, probably at the level of interhemispheric functionality. Uh, and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you get down to single neurons. And some of the single neurons will have a highly specialized, very local function. Functionality is therefore exists at many levels. And that's another a fact about cortex that blows everybody's mind and, and, and we have trouble with it. Uh, this is a 2008, I think, uh, simulation uh, of the cortex by Eugene Izikiewicz and Gerald Edelman. 
uh, who uh, published this in this Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and uh, Eugene uh, created this quite wonderful uh, cartoon uh, of the firing cortex that you can download from PNAS right now, and I highly recommend it, uh, because what you see emerging from that, uh, I should say that all the empirical input into this model came from actual neuronal evidence. So they knew a great deal about cortical neurons across a number of species, uh, and they used that evidence to, to kind of throw together uh, this cortex-like uh, simulation, uh, which actually turned out to have emergent properties that are really very nice. Uh, and one of the emergent properties, if you can see the red um, uh, blotches, um, I have a blue arrow pointing to some of the red blotches. Those are surf waves that emerge uh, from the cellular level uh, they are not programmed into the simulation, they're emergent. Uh, and they are one very, very strong reason for supposing that uh, the cortex uh, functions not just via individual neurons and individual neurons do firing, as you know, so they send discrete signals, but really also by oscillatory population waves. Uh, and that also was an insight uh, that I remember coming to from reading Eugene's papers. Uh, and the mathematical basis of that is that uh, loosely coupled uh, neurons uh, behave like waves if you get enough of them. Uh, and so we have at least two mathematical approaches to understanding cortex. One of them is called spike firing, and that's the level of individual neurons and population oscillations. And I believe that by now uh, we have direct empirical evidence for uh, just about all the population, uh, all the, all, all the uh, uh, oscillatory phenomena that have been studied for the last couple of centuries in oscillatory media uh, like air and water. Uh, and this, uh, this allows us to have one important theoretical approach to the functioning of cortex, uh, which I will not mention that particular one uh, because I'll focus on just the, uh, the, the present uh, theoretical ideas. Uh, next slide, please. So this weird old organ, uh, which goes back uh, at least uh, the neocortex, the outer helmet-shaped uh, part of the cortex, uh, goes back to early mammals. Uh, early mammals are emerged uh, in evolution about 200 million years ago. So the cortex has had a while uh, to evolve, uh, and of course it, it reforms itself. Uh, over the individual lifetime as well, beginning in utero, uh, in the body of a pregnant woman. Uh, and the current uh, evidence seems to indicate that around 23 weeks uh, after conception, uh, the cortex, uh, uh, well, I should really, really say this. Uh, if you have twins uh, in the same womb, uh, they start uh, fighting each other. Uh, they're not very strong, so they can't harm each other. Uh, but they start uh, boxing uh, and, and kicking each other um, uh, around 23 weeks of age. And, and that's evidence that comes from, uh, from NIH uh, right now, which is doing a fabulous uh, series of studies on cortex. Uh, now this, weird thing about this thing, and the, the great paradox that I've been wondering about now for far too long, and I'm not the only one, is how you can have 100 million neurons uh, and a quarter of a quadrillion synapses between them, and have this weird old thing uh, have, show radically limited capacity, and furthermore, limited capacity that is practically suicidal. 
Ich, uh, I had a near bad accident uh, about 10 years ago, I guess, uh, driving uh, on a road in Virginia. And I blame Virginia for this because I take these things very personally. And it was a hilly road, so I couldn't really see what was up ahead. And then I had a left turn, it was a two-way road. And then I had to make a left turn and I somehow got swamped with conscious thinking about the job of driving and turning left on a two-way road without really being able to see oncoming uh, traffic. Uh, and I practically hit a gentleman uh, driving a, a small truck uh, and we both spun out and braked and we were okay. Uh, but it was a very near thing, and the reason uh, is this biological weirdness uh, of limited capacity. And limited capacity is something that uh, uh, Google and Apple and every single uh, uh, web app developer uh, probably knows all about, because otherwise you can't really uh, create a user-friendly app uh, or user-friendly physical computer. Uh, because computers have to interact with people who all have this limited capacity feature. And the major question, of course, is, is this a bug uh, or is it a feature? And the fact is that for people who get harmed, and for cats, by the way, who also get harmed by their limited capacity, it's a bug. Uh, and for biology, it's a feature. And that means that from a Darwinian point of view, this enormous cortex with its radically limited conscious capacity had to pay for its upkeep. Uh, the cortex is perhaps the most costly organ biologically in the body uh, for many reasons that involve a different talk, uh, but very, very powerful reasons. We, uh, if, if, we, if we do not uh, get a fresh oxygen supply um, uh, at, from moment to moment as we do our breathing, uh, the cortex will start dying in about three minutes. So we have a three minute window of opportunity and window of risk. And that is true not just for us, but for all mammals and per perhaps for all land dwelling vertebrates. Uh, so this profound biological puzzle, uh, and I think this was well known, of course, uh, by cognitive scientists and psychologists and so on uh, at that time, uh, but people didn't take it that seriously because when you run into a, a fact that's a big puzzle, what practical people do is basically shrug their shoulders and go on to the next thing. And I suppose I was different uh, in one respect in that I got stuck right around 1983 uh, on this puzzle. Uh, and I still don't know the answer. And I invite you all to help me think about it uh, because one of these days we may be able to get the answer. I should mention, by the way, that most of the tentative answers that we have today are completely circular so that a typical uh, answer is that, well, uh, uh, the basal ganglia uh, have to serialize our actions. Uh, and since our output goes, uh, motor output control, uh, goes through the basal ganglia, so therefore the basal ganglia are responsible for limited capacity. But the question that emerges from that is, so why did the basal ganglia evolve in that particular way? And why is there this kind of funnel property uh, of consciousness? And why is it consciousness that has to be so limited? And the unconscious aspects of the cerebral cortex are vast and unknown, really. We don't have any good quantitative estimate of the information process processing and holding capacity, memory capacity, of the cerebral cortex, it's, it's way out of, it's big. Uh, and, and that's what we know. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the, the metaphor that we get from Plato and Aristotle and any number of other people in human history, most of whom we know nothing about because any records from human history have of course been lost, but this is plausibly a very ancient metaphor, although theaters themselves were not built in London, for example, until the time of Shakespeare. But people got around that because they would simply stand up uh, on their horse and scream at other people. Uh, and if you were a peasant and didn't have a horse, uh, uh, you would uh, tend to listen to whoever was, whichever horse rider was yelling at you. Uh, so in this particular metaphor, uh, the, the theater metaphor of consciousness, uh, that we can call uh, some function uh, we can call selective attention uh, does selection. It lights up the conscious bright spot. And so there's a very intimate uh, co variation between selective attention and consciousness, but they are not the same. And that fact that attention and consciousness are not the same is reflected in our everyday language which uh, goes back to Proto-Indo-European uh, about 4,000 to 6,000 years ago. Uh, the idea is probably uh, very similar. Uh, we ask people to please pay attention, which is an idiom that we use all the time when trying to quiet, quiet a classroom of uh, yelling kids. Uh, for example, we say, please pay attention. Uh, but what we really mean is, please become conscious of this uh, lady opera singer performing in the spotlight on the stage and everything is dark, literally everything is dark. All we see is the opera singer because she is in the spotlight uh, and everything backstage is dark. Uh, meaning everything that contextualizes and frames the conscious event uh, is unconscious and everything in the audience is also unconscious. Um, so, so this is an attempt uh, to account for limited capacity of consciousness, momentary consciousness, moment to moment consciousness, it cycles uh, uh, about 10 hertz uh, consciousness can be uh, uh, can be uh, followed about uh, 10 hertz, but then the duration of a single conscious moment under optimal conditions is about three seconds long. So the, the fading time of a single conscious event uh, occurs over about three seconds, and the cycle time, the dwell time, uh, of the underlying brain mechanism of consciousness seems to cycle right around alpha uh, or theta uh, oscillations uh, near 10 hertz. Uh, next slide, please. So the latest and greatest uh, version uh, that we've published uh, was in 2013, and this has now been uh, both confirmed and also further developed by uh, some very, very interesting people. Uh, I should, first of all, acknowledge uh, Stan Dehaan and Jean-Pierre Changeux in, in Paris, who have been working uh, on this fundamental set of ideas for decades, uh, and they've been working at the French equivalent of the National Science Foundation, so it, it's been a very serious and, and very uh, competent uh, effort. Uh, so Stan Dehaan and Jean-Pierre Changeux uh, called their idea Global Neuronal Workspace Theory, which I'm very happy about because they're very good. They make very nice neural net models and they test them absolutely terrifically. Uh, in, in very rigorous ways, which I will not cover right now, but maybe during the Q&A. So, so this is the theory. Uh, we're looking at cortex from the left-hand side. So this is the left lateral side of the left hemisphere. 
Uh, and we're pretending to look at the thalamus, which obviously is not really visible because it's covered up by the cortex. And this imaginary person is looking via his or her foveal vision, uh, two to four degrees of arc, uh, at a stimulus that is being presented for at least uh, oh, 50 milliseconds is, is a good guess. Uh, which makes it possible for for his or her brain uh, to uh, to become conscious uh, of that information. Uh, and uh, Mary Potter at MIT discovered um, decades ago uh, that one of the things that happens is if, is that if you have <clears throat> pardon me, if you have two stimuli being presented one after the other. Uh, that the second stimulus will be masked uh, by the, the first one will be conscious, the second one will be identical in terms of the activation of, uh, uh, of the uh, receptor neurons in the fovea, uh, and it will be continue to be identical, certainly up to area V1 uh, of the visual cortex, and probably quite a bit higher. Uh, but what happens, according to Dahan and Changer, uh, what happens uh, at area IT or MTL or both uh, is an explosion, uh, an ignition. Uh, what they call an ignition, uh, I called it a broadcast uh, in the 80s and 90s when I was talking about this because I was working off certain what I call, now call a media metaphor, because a theater is really a, uh, an information medium, is it not? It's an information medium where the singing soprano, soprano on stage in the spotlight is being heard and is being admired by all kinds of unconscious <clears throat> characters sitting in the audience. Uh, so, uh, in French, the word ignition uh, is probably works a lot better than broadcast. So they use ignition and I'm perfectly happy with that. Uh, what does seem to happen and the evidence now has gotten very solid and I'm usually very slow in accepting and understanding evidence. Uh, so I, I tend to wait uh, and a lot of other people get there first, which is perfectly good. Uh, and what we know now from very high resolution recordings uh, in the brain, again, uh, many of them in epileptics who are having uh, enormous uh, uh, patches of, neuro, uh, of electrodes uh, uh, being implanted uh, on their cortex. Uh, the surgical flap is closed so that the injury can recover but at the same time, you can, you can still record from cortex. So uh, in, in one recent wonderful study, uh, they used uh, more than 1,200 electrodes over six different epileptic surgery, surgeon, uh, sorry, epileptic patients in surgery. Uh, and so, uh, so we've got this huge data set uh, and we now have many huge data sets and we can see these little ignitions uh, the hypothesis here, this is a hypothesis uh, sketch, uh, is that uh, some of the ignitions will happen in V1 or near V1. Uh, and a particular example that I like, I like for that one is if you're looking at a single star on a dark night and you're properly dark adapted and all that kind of stuff. So you can see the single star. What's coming into your eyes is about a flow uh, uh, of, uh, of single photons, uh, actually about 16 photons coming into the, the outer eye and activating only a single visual receptor in the fovea. And that only requires a single quantum uh, of light, a single photon. Uh, and since we're essentially dealing with one spot of light uh, at the very lowest threshold of a single quantum of light going into your fovea, uh, going into a foveal receptor, 
Um, and I believe that that emerges in consciousness probably very early because all the information is available to cortex uh, at that point around V1 or V2, um, uh, something like that. Uh, and I should mention, going back to earlier uh, parts of this talk, that this ignition uh, that happens is predictable predictable from the bi-directional connectivity. I'll repeat that awful phrase. The bi-directional connectivity of every single cell in the cortical thalamic system and every other cell in the cortical thalamic system. So these are both excitatory cells, uh, they're glutamatergic, and that means that the cortex is always in danger of blowing up, as any half-decent engineer will tell you. Uh, and the, the major question, and this is something that the really wonderful neurobiologists that I've talked to on this, this is something that keeps them up at night, worrying, uh, why doesn't the cortex blow up? Uh, but we know that it doesn't blow up. Although there are children, by the way, who develop early epilepsy and it's transient. So there's no need to do much about it at all, except reassure the child, uh, because it'll go away by itself. And that's also a miraculous question. How the hell does the cortex uh, cure itself in early uh, and, and reasonably normal epilepsy? Um, so you do get these explosions, they're extremely well modulated, well regulated, but we do not know exactly how. Uh, there are some really uh, advanced hypotheses uh, on this. Uh, and the hypothesis that I would advocate is that uh, that single star uh, on a dark night uh, does emerge visually, in visual consciousness, very early in the so-called visual hierarchy, which is not a hierarchy at all. Uh, and in fact, uh, it can be, uh, by the time you tell your friend, you ask your friend, uh, what's the name of that star uh, that we're looking at? And your friend answers that uh, it's Alpha Centauri or something like that. By that time, your prefrontal cortex is engaged your brokers and Wernicke's areas are engaged and all that stuff cycles. The, the key idea is that this is all resonant signaling occurring in the cerebral cortex uh, and resonant signaling allows for ignitions to occur because what you get basically uh, is, uh, is positive feedback explosions, but they're not enormous, they're very local. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. And here's a very pretty experiment by, uh, from a group uh, first authored by Sam Duisberg. Uh, and what's so pretty about it is that it's very simple. Uh, you take an, a, a, a simple flashing uh, light, a very small flashing light uh, in the left half uh, of the visual field uh, that's the left half of both the left eye and the uh, bright eye, and it comes into the uh, into the into the eyeball, both of the eyeballs, and, and then emerges on the right hand half of the fovea, uh, and from there, uh, for the left eye, it travels, crosses over, and ends up in V1 uh, in the right hemisphere. And uh, if you take the right eye, it just travels straight within the right hemisphere uh, to area V1. And uh, what you don't see, of course, is the thalamic uh, nucleus, the visual nucleus, LGN. But in fact, what we're looking at is resonant activity because the cortical thalamic system does resonant activity. That's pretty much all it does. Uh, at least for the neocortex. Paleocortex is a little different. Paleocortex being the, uh, the cortex before the emergence of mammals 200 million years ago. And in this very pretty experiment, what you can see is an explosion uh, uh, around the uh, V1 area uh, of the right hemisphere. 
Uh, and so this is averaged out and processed and all that kind of stuff, but it mostly occurs uh, in the right side area, V1, uh, where this single bright light is probably a flashing uh, light uh, emerges in cortex. And as you can see, there is an ignition. Uh, there's also something of an ignition on the left-hand side, by the way, you can see that. And the reason for that is that uh, there is point-to-point -point mapping between uh, very fine-grained uh, spots, uh, locations on the right-hand cortex corresponding to locations on the left, uh, left cortex, left hemisphere. Uh, and that's, uh, that travels over the corpus callosum, uh, which is an enormous uh, highway. It is not a block between the two hemispheres. Well, it is that to some extent. But most of the time, you can see uh, symmetrical activity in both hemispheres occurring because the corpus callosum uh, is helping the two hemispheres to talk with each other point to point. Uh, next slide, please. And this is another nice experiment uh, run by uh, uh, Jerry Edelman ran, ran this at the Neurosciences Institute and Ramesh Srinivasan uh, was the first author. Uh, I had the misfortune of being one of the subjects in this horrible experiment. So I got to experience the, uh, the, the conscious aspect myself um, and I did not like it at all. Uh, but what we got out of it was this uh, nice uh, signal correlation between the left and right uh, cortex, uh, e even though, and I should have mentioned this right off the bat, we're talking about a binocular rivalry uh, experiment so that uh, either the left eye or the right eye is dominant at any given time. Um, and, uh, and, and so we can compare the effects of the conscious input stream to a very closely matched unconscious input stream. And that's, of course, the experimental key uh, to all this research. You have to go do, make very, very close comparisons between conscious and unconscious processes. And by now we have at least a dozen very, very well worked out ways of doing that um, binocular rivalry has been studied since the 19th century um, and it's quite well understood. Uh, and the only additional point about this is that the stimuli use um, what's called flicker tagging because that made it possible in 1991 or 1999, I can't remember, uh, to track uh, the stimulus using MEG. So we're looking at uh, Pico Tesla here um, in terms of the intensity of the signal, of the magnetic uh, signals uh, going from very light blue to darker blue, to black, to red, to orange, to yellow. Uh, and we're talking about uh, plus 0.8 Pico Teslas at the very top uh, and minus 0 0.8 uh, Pico Teslas uh, at the bottom. So it's, it's a nice uh, uh, kind of dose response. Uh, next slide, please. And we've seen this before, so please go on to the next one. Uh, I just want to read the top. Uh, Andrew, if you would uh, backtrack to the one where the top says, um, one more, and one more. And this is a slogan uh, that I'd, I would like to broadcast, uh, which is that Cortex does massively parallel computation. Uh, and we didn't know much at all about massively parallel computation in the 1980s or even the 1990s. And today, of course, it is headline news for people interested in the web and uh, uh, co uh, computer networks, massively parallel computation. Uh, next slide, please. And just scroll on down to, you've seen that one. 
Uh, you've seen that one. We've seen that one. This particular one, by the way, which is the predictive uh, slide. Uh, Andrew, would you back up a little uh, until we see the head? Yeah, 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 right, right there. Uh, uh, this is a prediction uh, that we made and which appears in uh, uh, the book that Natalie Gill and I uh, put together uh, called um, Unconsciousness. Uh, and, uh, uh, and basically, this is a prediction based on the evidence that we had at the time. And by now, that prediction has been reasonably well uh, uh, verified by two uh, really excellent research groups. Uh, one is an epilepsy uh, medical uh, imaging group, uh, uh, first authored by Wendy Herman. Uh, and it appeared by now, I think, about five years ago. Uh, and involved very high resolution uh, monitoring, um, direct cortical monitoring of cortex uh, and showed a spreading phenomena, an ignition phenomena very much like this. The second uh, uh, group that I want to mention is Gustavo Deco's uh, group, which just published a, a very, very nice article, uh, which proposed a, an interpretation uh, of the of consciousness in the cortical connectome, the connectome being the street map uh, of the connect major connectivities of the known connectivities of the cortex. Uh, and if I get a chance during the Q and A, uh, I will show you an image of the connectome, and with a lot of luck, because I'm not sure that I have it right now. The connectome uh, is looks like a mandala. Basically, it's not a mandala exactly, it's a street map and it's therefore empirical. Uh, and mandalas are essentially beautiful artistic uh, artistic products. So, so they tend to be symmetrical and evenly distributed on all sides and so on. Uh, the connectome is an empirical thing. And so like any street map of, of a huge uh, urban area, it's not even a city, it's a, it's a huge urban complex, if you want a metaphor, uh, for the connectivity of cortex. Uh, and the con connectivity is now the level of uh, physiological re re resolution that we can study things at. Uh, and the uh, DECO group has essentially proposed very intelligently that the equivalent of a global workspace uh, in the connectome is a kind of a dynamic rich club of connected nodes and links. Uh, so you can determine uh, a rich club for any given uh, task, a visual task. Um, uh, you can determine that uh, even using fMRI. And of course, these days we can, we can do uh, much higher resolution and much better temporal resolution particularly um, and, and so you can propose a hypothesis. And this one is really very nice. The idea of a rich club, a rich club is basically the idea that uh, most networks in biology and most networks in society tend to follow a 2080 rule in which 20 of the nodes uh, in the network uh, uh, are able to broadcast, this is my way of saying it, are able to broadcast to essentially all of the network, to 100% of the network, and certainly to the other 80%. So 20% uh, broadcast to 80%. Uh, and because this is a resonance system, the receivers of that broadcast also feed back. They are doing a kind of a handshaking routine with the source uh, of the information, uh, which uh, we now know from the Hall and uh, one major source of visual conscious information is area IT. Uh, IT is the infrarotemporal area, infrotemporal meaning the bottom of the temporal lobe. Uh, and in area IT, we know from independent evidence we recognize kind of the standard uh, visual objects of the 
interpretation of the world that humans make. So we, we recognize people, uh, we recognize faces, uh, we recognize automobiles and houses and that level of uh, size, uh, because that's very useful for us as human beings. And then of course, uh, developmentally, uh, we can also learn to recognize very small ant size objects, for example, and very large, enormously large uh, uh, objects like the uh, the oncoming uh, hurricane that is heading for Florida even now, as I speak. That's not that's a lie, by the way. Uh, that's not true, uh, but it's conceivable. Next slide, please. We've seen that one. Next slide, please. We've seen that one. Hey, Bernie. Yes. I think you're done with your slides, um, at least the ones you sent me. And I'm wondering if we can go to Q&A now because we have a fabulous audience and I anticipate lots of questions that would allow you to elaborate further. Uh, Susan, I really wanna thank you uh, for regulating my explosive tendencies here. Uh, that's exactly what's needed. So thank you very much. And of oh. course, yes. Um, okay, so the first person um, is Len Lenore Blum. She has a great question for you. And while she asks it, um, Polly, who's been kind enough to organize this, is going to, I believe, put everybody on screen so we can have more of an interactive Q&A. And great. People, if they could be kind enough to raise their question, to raise their hand if they have a question and um, I'll try to get everybody um, in order. Um, so Lenore, did you uh, wanna go ahead and ask your question? Hi. Now Lenore's muted. Polly, can you unmute her? I did. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, hello. Oh, great, okay, so thank you very much, Bernie. And as you may know, Manuel Blum and me, Lenore Blum, are great fans of yours. So uh, thank you, and it's really great to hear this. So one thank thing you. I just want to know, as you know, there are many theories of consciousness, and I wanted to know if you see things like uh, theories that measure consciousness or purport to measure consciousness, at, like IIT, as being complementary to global workspace. Um, and there's another, I have a zillion questions. Another one is, do you see that uh, feedback and this bi-directional connections as really important also as some of the dynamics of that is critical for consciousness? Well, the answer to the second part is absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it is both uh, clearly uh, critical to the functioning of cortex because it's found in all the animals that I think have been studied, including humans, mm -hmm. uh, with the right uh, resolution uh, to pick up uh, the signal flow uh, in cortex. And, uh, and we know that the cortex, uh, among other things, is a wave medium, uh, which is exactly what you would expect, of course, from uh, bidirectional connections between 100 million um, neurons. Uh, so so uh, say, uh, firing neurons, if they're loosely coupled uh, from a mathematical point of view, um, th they will vary a little bit, they won't be perfectly synchronized, and what will emerge from that in terms of the population level is a huge variety of oscillations. And we, we know about standing waves in cortex, for example, we know about traveling waves in cortex, uh, all the kind of, we know, hurricanes, cyclones, uh, uh, and even nonlinear, uh, nonlinear uh, cinematic uh, kind of clicking phenomena in cortex. And this comes from Walter Freeman and Robert Kozma. Uh, very fabulous uh, work and very puzzling, of course, which is exactly what it should be because you're not supposed to know the answers at the beginning. Anyway, uh, hello to everybody who's now showing up on the screen. Uh, so uh, the first question uh, is that the idea that there are many theories of consciousness is, is simply not true. Uh, there are many speculations uh, about consciousness, but if you look at the empirically based theories, we have maybe half a dozen, something like that, 
uh, and they have considerable uh, agreement among uh, mm -hmm. the various points of view. So I don't uh, consider this much of a competitive environment, uh, given the kind of cutthroat competition uh, that scientists are capable of sometimes. Uh, this is not a cutthroat thing at all, as far as I can tell. I really admire uh, and, and like uh, the other people who have taken the trouble to uh, to dig into the enormous amount of evidence that's relevant and I really welcome them um, and I keep an open mind because I do not know the answer. Uh, if I thought I did know the answer uh, I would probably uh, you know be ready for uh, for the final retirement home uh, which I'm not. Uh, um, really I do not know the answer. So Giulio's uh, IIT, uh, Giulio Trinoni's uh, IIT is interesting. Uh, I question it because that's what we do. Um, mm -hmm. And I like uh, Giulio enormously. I met him many years ago at the Neurosciences Institute. We had good conversation. And the IIT idea, uh, I believe IIT, the quantitative I idea, is the square of a quantity called mutual information, which is essentially the flow of classical information across some dividing line, some imaginary dividing line. Uh, and since it goes in two directions, it's called mutual information or MI. And I believe that is still the source of idea of IIT. Uh, my problem with it is that I can't figure out why it's useful. Uh, I know why global workspaces are useful because Alan Newell showed us how useful global workspaces can be in the face of this incredible ambiguity of the acoustical signal of spoken speech in, in a normal room, which is incredibly sloppy, right? We, we know that our speech echoes from hard surfaces and it gets absorbed in soft surfaces, and we don't speak all that carefully. And the vocal tract, of course, is not a digital a source of digital information. It's a source of analog information and all. The, and your tongue is, is a big, heavy object that has drag and inertia and all these sloppy, sloppy things. So the signal is a pain to deal with. And by now, of course, uh, we have Siri and any number of other speech recognition techniques, but I think Siri actually still uses crowdsources, crowdsourcing on the web. Yes. I'm sorry, um, you have a bunch of questions. So is it okay if I move down the list? Because we, I don't want to run out of time. So, keep, okay, keep so me. the next, the Be next my one is- prefrontal cortex, please. <laughs> okay, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so Congressman Jerry McNerney's here, and he had a question. Do you still have your question, Jerry? Hi. Hello, Congressman. Need to unmute here. Well, thank you for recognizing me, uh, Susan and, and Bernard. I've, I've enjoyed uh, listening here. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert in this field, but one of the things that occurs to me is uh, how important uh, all the other bodily parts are in influencing your consciousness, say, uh, your kidneys or uh, the muscles uh, uh, in your foot. I mean, all of this stuff has to contribute in one way or another uh, to what is incoming to your brain and influencing the way you uh, make decisions. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, so we have uh, a cerebral cortex uh, that interacts with everything. Uh, and we now know, of course, uh, about the hundreds of millions of uh, uh, tiny single-celled organisms that live in our gut and which make it possible for us to produce serotonin, for example, which is the, the way we calm ourselves down when we fall asleep. Uh, so we've got this enormously interactive system and there's a but uh, that is attached to this because uh, brain-body integration is a major topic in medicine, it's a major topic in science and, and so on. It's a big, big deal. But uh, what seems to be the case, as far as I can tell, is that uh, things really 
explode and intensify in this relatively limited cerebral cortex that we have. So the point of view going back a hundred years to people who study the spinal cord, for example, spinal cord is a big, big highway uh, into cerebral cortex, as you can obviously see, uh, the spinal cord by itself it does not support consciousness. And this huge set of peripheral neurons that we have uh, all the way down to our fingertips, for example, and our tongues, which are both very densely populated uh, with sensory neurons. Uh, all that stuff is incoming into the cerebral cortex, but uh, it does not emerge directly from uh, from the point of stimulation. So if you put your your if you burn your your finger on a hot surface, for example, that is essentially a local phenomenon that is reported to the cortex, and then the cortex starts to blast it and, and turn it into a headline uh, within the central nervous system. And then you can act upon it, of course, in a voluntary way. Uh, so this is all uh, very traditional. Uh, there's been a century of uh, research on that particular question, actually. And this well, thank, is, I thank you for that answer. And I, I just want to say I appreciate the view that your cortex is ready to uh, explode or fail at any one time and, and needs a lot of engineering to, to keep going. So um, thank you for the presentation. You're very welcome. So, um, Bernie, the next question I had on the list was from your friend, Scott Kelso. Scott, did he cover everything about the IIT? It seemed like you had Hi, a, Scott. Further, a further question. <laughs> I've wanted to meet Scott Kelso for years and years and years, by the way. And it's very nice to meet you right now. Scott, you're muted though. Oh, is it me? Hi. Hello, Bernie. Uh, Good to meet you. Some, sometimes, so, somehow we missed each other at the Neurosciences Research Institute because I was there in uh, 1997. Uh, with Jerry and Giulio Tononi, and, and your model reminded me of a guy called Eric Loomer. The thalamocortical model is uh, uh, was Eric's work with uh, Jerry, right? Uh, and it, then uh, yes, Ishikevich picked it up, and so on. Anyway, uh, so uh, you, you discussed a little bit uh, the Tononi theory of integrated information theory. Uh, I think what he wanted there was a, the idea that a conscious state, whatever that is, I was going to ask you what are the state variables uh, for consciousness, uh, what do you think there? Uh, but everyone agrees, including to Hayne, Stanislas to Hayne, that a conscious state is somewhat both uh, integrated and differentiated at the same time. Yes. And I'm wondering, uh, I, I have some ideas about how that actually works uh, in terms of the metastable uh, dynamics of the brain. So you get right. actually both converging and diverging processes going on at the same time. And I just wondered right. if you could just speak to that a little bit. Well, uh, that's absolutely correct. Uh, my apologies to Eric Loomer, by the way. Uh, who was certainly around uh, uh, and who certainly worked with Edelman uh, who uh, at, and they co-developed uh, uh, a biological approach uh, to these ideas, which is very much, uh, well, let me put it this way. I think what we're doing, you know, I started off in experimental psychology a long time ago, uh, and then I uh, managed to, you know, uh, wander into something we call cognitive science. And that seems to be an improvement. Uh, and then we got into something called cognitive neuroscience. Uh, and then I met Jerry and, and the others, uh, and I realized that we were really doing uh, 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 biology. And because we're still interested in the psyche, I think we're really doing psycho. Uh, biology. And, and that's uh, one word for the vast expanse 
uh, of evidence and theory that we now have access to. Uh, and, and it's a very wonderful thing. It's, it's one of the great, I believe, it's one of the great meeting places in the history of science. Uh, and meeting places like this do occur uh, historically. Uh, so the question you're answer is exactly the right question. I do not know the answer. Uh, and I'm going to leave that uh, unanswered uh, because I want to call your attention to really great work uh, that I love uh, by the late Walter Freeman and Robert Kozma. Uh, Freeman being a, a very great uh, neurobiologist at UC Berkeley and Robert Kozma, um, being a very, very fine uh, mathematician uh, who is fortunately still with us. Uh, and I would refer you particularly to the uh, Walter Freeman discovery about layer one of cortex. And you seem to be nodding. So I get the impression that you've probably looked at that work. Uh, it is fabulous work. It's totally unexpected, which is a very good thing. Uh, 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 and and it, it suggests possibly uh, that layer one uh, and perhaps the other horizontal layers of the cortex, I think layer four, uh, also is kind of a dendritic uh, cloth, right? A felt work that has uh, a very intense horizontal uh, connectivity as well as vertical connectivity because cortex has both of those, but layer one is what Walter studied uh, first in rabbits, I think, and then in humans. And it turns out that he, uh, that he discovered a kind of uh, cortical clicking phenomenon uh, running about 10 Hertz, uh, which he viewed from a nonlinear mathematical perspective uh, as an emergent, uh, uh, plateau uh, of uh, an emergent plateau uh, of, of stable resonance. So here we get the word stability, which is so vital uh, in the questions that we're trying to understand. Uh, uh, we get a stable plateau for nearly 100 milliseconds, followed by a chaotic collapse. Uh, for, uh, lasting about five to 10 uh, milliseconds. And layer one uh, is really, really important. And it appears to have this nonlinear zero lag uh, uh, feature, as you know, so that Walter thought that entirely, entire hemispheres at the layer one level are essentially click clicking. And his word for that was cinematically clicking. Uh, so you, you've got this 100 millisecond st stable states followed by 5 to 10 milliseconds chaotic collapses, followed by reorganization. We're talking about self-organization here, right? Um, and another uh, resonance plateau that emerges from that. And so every 10, uh, uh, sorry, tenth of a second, the entire hemisphere or certainly large parts of the hemisphere uh, reorganize. They, they, they go into chaos, reorganize, go into chaos and reorganize. And then the question, of course, is what the hell does this have to do with the normal way we, we look at the cortex, which is using Fourier analysis, uh, because we're looking at uh, frequencies over time. Uh, and, uh, and for that, uh, Walter and Robert worked out the usefulness of Hilbert analysis, which has to do with spatial frequencies. Uh, and essentially, it, it's analogous to Fourier analysis. Uh, but what you, what Walter, Walter's insight he has many, many important insights, but one of them was that, <clears throat> excuse me, that layer one of cortex, which is the felt work, it's a horizontal, very dense horizontal weave of dendrites, uh, the felt work is driving the vertical volleys, uh, which we normally record and uh, interpret via Fourier analysis. So we're looking at half of what the brain is doing in signaling terms, but not at uh, Walter and Robert's half of what the brain is doing. Uh, we're looking at what may be this gigantic uh, explosive uh, 
felt work, this cloth that surrounds the other layers of cortex. Uh, and because the dendrites that make up the felt work are, come from the same cells as the axons that emerge vertically, you're going cortical, 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 thalami, uh, and so on, uh, they're the same cells. So, so explosive clicking uh, in the dendrites of the pyramidal cells is going to be reflected in, in bursts, in volleys that go out of the axons of those same cells. And then, of course, it, let's say it reaches another pyramidal cell in thalamus uh, and it bounces back and you get resonance going back and forth. Uh, and in this interpretation, and I don't know if Walter would, would have agreed with this, but it's, we can kick it around, uh, is it, basically what's happening is layer one uh, uh, picks up, uh, accumulates information, organizes it uh, within about a hundred millisecond stable state. That's an all or none state uh, in, in terms of the Hilbert analysis. And that all or none state serves as a controller uh, for the oscillatory activity of the cortex. Uh, so that's at least a hypothesis and it makes sense. And if we combine it with uh, Deco's uh, idea uh, that uh, we want to look for the rich club, uh, this is not the anatomical rich club, but the signaling rich club, right? So this is all the rich folks at the country club who are uh, buying and selling and uh, trying to talk each other into buying stocks and those kinds of things. Uh, they're communicating with each other. That's the key thing. Uh, these are not just static uh, connections. They're not just anatomical. They have to do with signaling. Uh, and the general idea is that the, the dynamic uh, rich club may serve as a functional uh, global workspace for cortex. Uh, so it's a long answer and I see you nodding. So uh, <laughs> so I figure we're, we're talking, right? Yes, well, uh, of course, uh, Robert uh, Kozma is a very close friend and Walter yeah. and others are with many, many uh, discussions together over, the over time. Uh, dynamically, Walter evolved from fixed points to limit cycles and from limit cycles to chaos with Christine Scarda. And then in the last work, uh, onto phase transitions. And of course, in, in our work, we've been doing work on phase transitions for a long time. Really? Uh, yes. This, this, and, this, and that's another this igniting, this, igniting, this igniting idea of, that's also with Tehane and Changeur, is pretty much what we would call non-equilibrium phase transitions. Non-equilibrium, yes, yes. Uh, I, I should have, I quoted Edelman earlier, uh, the word, word he used, but the cortex uh, runs uh, very close, if I've got it uh, right. Close to yeah. To close to instability, yeah. so, it's, uh, so it, ten, it, it runs the danger of uh, losing equilibrium and going into a non-equilibrium chaos uh, uh, about 10 times a second. Uh, and, and those are all very profound ideas mathematically and in terms of signal engineering and all that kind of stuff. So, so thank you for- Thank you. Uh, <laughs> for filling me in uh, on that. And here's yet another, you know, uh, what you keep on learning, of course, uh, after a while that uh, between Aristotle and Plato, uh, everybody for the last 2,500 years who studied all that stuff, uh, had a very, very good idea uh, about it all. So we're talking about the, uh, the, the, the college of, uh, uh, of intellectual, uh, intellectuals kicking ideas back and forth over 2,500 years. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, we're making progress in one of these days, who knows? This is great. And I just wanted to um, mention this session's being recorded too. So we'll post it up to the center website. Um, the next question, and oh, by the way, um, it looks like we have a bunch of consciousness junkies here, but I just want to mention if you need to go, <laughs> please, no, no, no. you know, feel free to check out. This is, you know, our session has officially gone over, but I did tell 
a, a bunch of people in the AGI group in the new center that we were going to be hanging around to talk about some of Bernie's papers that he suggested, including the deco piece, which has come up and which is right. great. That is just fabulous. So the next question, so anybody who needs to leave, thank you for coming. Um, it's just been wonderful to have you. Um, the next question is from the associate director of the center, um, Elan Barinholtz. Um, take it away. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, the gorilla in the room, obviously, is this the definition of this term consciousness. And it seems to me like you're trying to in some ways brush it aside by just operationally defining it as reportability, but does that actually give us anything close to what people want? And are we really, are, are you gonna actually make the claim that our theories don't include nonverbal humans, uh, preverbal humans, nonverbal uh, other species? Uh, you know, I presume that, I, or perhaps you are, if you're committing to it, then are, are we, you know, is, is that actually an, an implication? Uh, is the theory only meant, in, in which case, why don't we just call it a theory of reportability and why even refer to it as a theory of consciousness? It seems to me- Oh, like uh, that would be fine. Uh, that would be fine to call it a theory of uh, reportability. Uh, uh, and, um, and then for you and me as conscious individuals, uh, we probably notice that uh, reportability uh, comes ties with uh, subjective experiences. Uh, and when you do the careful experiments like Dehane and Changer and so on, uh, you could actually experience the, the first 52 milliseconds uh, exposure. Uh, and uh, uh, I know a famous scientist in Europe who actually wrote a paper uh, fairly recently uh, called, How Do I Know I'm Conscious? Uh, and I was so tempted to send him the answer uh, or to recommend uh, to him, uh, you know, the, the solid empirical way uh, to discover the answer. He doesn't have to ask me, he can just ask Aristotle if he wanted to. Uh, because, it, you know, traditionally, in traditional philosophy before 1900, this was not news, right? Everybody kind of knew it uh, because traditional uh, philosophy, Western philosophy is Aristotelian. And it's also Platonist, of course. And so the, the whole range of kind of common sense conscious experiences was, uh, was heavily discussed and written about during that long period of time. And what's happened since 1900 and the rise of behaviorism and uh, physicalistic reductionism, uh, I should say the wrong kind of physicalistic reductionism, because the crucial thing in reductionism, of course, is not, are you going to explain one thing in terms of something else? The crucial question is, how are you going to do it? And what level of reduction is going to serve your purposes of trying to understand to the maximal degree? Uh, so if you're Albert Einstein, uh, you don't really want to see quantum phenomena at all, right? Because they violate your, your deep intuitions about the nature of the universe. Uh, so there are certain levels of, of reduction. If you're a modern particle physicist, you do want to see uh, quantum phenomena. You want to see them even where they might not exist. So uh, we, we have to get the right level of reduction. And we can use neurons, for example, but neurons are always contextualized by other neurons uh, and they're contextualized by the amount of glucose and the current surge of glucose, uh, glucose that's coming through the bloodstream uh, to, to feed this very hungry cell uh, so that it can operate in many, many different ways. It has all kinds of uh, information processing type uh, operations. I want to use that careful use that phrase very carefully. Uh, so so this, the individual neural cell is a kind of network. Uh, it is surrounded by other cells that also creates a, a larger network and so on. And so we, we have this multi-scale phenomenon. And, and for various, for each uh, uh, empirical study, we want to look at a particular level of reduction. That's very, very important. But we're talking about biology, right? Uh, and, and so we're talking about, in case of, uh, of the neocortex, the helmet-shaped outer cortex, uh, we're talking about 200 million years 
of mammalian evolution. And so what happens uh, that uh, during that period of time at many, many levels of evolution and life development. And as we know, of course, by the time we get consciousness emerging in utero, uh, by that time, the cortex begins to operate on a second by second basis, acquiring new links and pruning out uh, useless neurons and doing all that work of adaptation again at many many levels of analysis. Uh, so the uh, so I'm not a reductionist. Uh, I'm uh, I'm not any uh, specifiable reductionist. Let me put it that way, uh, except perhaps uh, pragmatically, and and pragmatically doesn't commit you to anything basically, uh, as as you. As probably pragmatically you, you by pragmatically mean in a way that solves the the scientific problem so to speak of, of measurable something measurable but at the same time it's it still is synonymous with other levels of explanation i would i would certainly think so uh for scientists who are interested uh, in the goals of science it's certainly uh uh pragmatism uh, means that essentially what you just said uh, but more broadly, uh, pragmatism has to do with testing truth by function. And by function, we do not mean mathematical functions, of course. We mean biological functions, which are totally different. And it's sort of too bad that the same word is used because it is confusing. Uh, but biological functions have to ultimately do with survival and reproductive fitness. Uh, and so we can use those as reasonable criteria uh, for the uh, evolutionary aspects uh, of the conscious brain. Uh, and then, of course, we get the experiential aspects of the conscious brain, which may begin around the 23rd week of gestation. Uh, and certainly by the time of, of normal birth, uh, of full-term birth, uh, we're looking at a conscious brain because uh, the, the, the newborn's brain, uh, the, the language that's used is that it looks like it's dreaming. Well, dreaming is a conscious state. Uh, and that has been known, uh, as you know, for, for 50 years, uh, because dreaming was called paradoxical sleep by the person who discovered it. And the word paradoxical sleep really meant a brain that looks like it's awake, but it's behaviorally sleeping. So you've got your eyes closed, you're lying back, you're turning and whatever you need to do to, to stay comfortable enough in, in sleep. Uh, but if you do an EEG, and even 50 years ago, the EEG was good enough to pick up the fact that you're no longer seeing slow waves. Uh, you are seeing what then was called uh, uh, at low amplitude, high frequency, random looking activity. Uh, and, uh, and we now know, uh, this is a very embarrassing confession, and it only is for people in science who won't tell anybody uh, in the real world, and particularly not tell uh, Congress members uh, about this. Uh, but for most of my career, uh, we had it all wrong about the waking state. And the reason why we have it all wrong is because humans have a thick skull, which reduces the signal, uh, the signal to noise ratio from the cortical signal to noise ratio, which is measured in millivolts, as we perfectly well knew, to uh, microvolts, which is the best we can do uh, in scalp recordings at least until recent times, but I don't even want to talk about that. So, uh, so what we get is a massive 99.9% .9 signal loss when we only use uh, scalp recordings. And, and that's a kind of a revolutionary, uh, oh my God, you know, slap your forehead um, and, and say dirty words uh, thing, because it means that we have been misunderstanding the difference between conscious and unconscious, natural unconscious and conscious state, meaning waking and deep sleep. We have been misunderstanding that until really quite recently, except for 
Waldo Penfield, who understood it very well uh, around 1920. Okay, fabulous. Um, now, it looks like everybody's still riveted. Um, I guess I'll check in one last time if there are more questions and forgive me if I missed anybody. Um, people are need to raise their hands. Um, we have to get you back, Bernie, like come to our, our group meeting. Um, oh, this is great. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, let me just check in if there are any others. Um, Susan, I think Chris Nataro had a question. Okay, and I'm seeing Manuel Blum as well. Um, okay, Hello. So Chris, do you have a question? And then Manuel? Manuel, that is, sorry. Uh, can you wait? Uh, there you are. Oh, you're muted. Yep. I think Chris is gonna ask. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear Hi. you. Uh, yes, I can hear you. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, my, my question has to do with uh, um, uh, uh, Gallup. Uh, uh, not not George Gallup. It's uh, well. Anyway, uh, Gallup's mirror test. You you know the mirror test. I do. And, yes. Uh, uh, and and we Lenore and I have both thought of the mirror test as being uh, uh, maybe a a first attempt at getting a sense of what is conscious or not. And it's rather interesting that uh, there are two animals that most people would not expect to have any sense of consciousness, but that pass the mirror test. And I'm thinking of the fish, which is the cleaner wrasse, uh, <laughs> which does pass the mirror test, and an ant uh, hey. <laughs> that also does pass the mirror test. Uh, That's really funny. Very, yeah. Well, I, I think the facts that you that you've just mentioned show us uh, both the good and the bad aspects of the of the visual mirror test. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, of course, you're quite right. Dogs don't pass the mirror test, but they 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 pass a, something called the smell test. There you and, go. Uh, and. Uh, Children uh, don't pass the mirror test until they're about two to two and a half years old. Oh. So uh, my, my, uh, my, my question is basically, uh, we think that the mirror test is uh, a very good beginning to a, for a test to, for consciousness. And have you thought about anything like that? Yes, I have. Uh, but because uh, I, I need to follow a very narrow empirical trail uh, I did not like the mirror test when it was first proposed and had a lot of impact, right? Uh, and the reason why, uh, well, I, I can, right now I, I can give you two important reasons. Uh, one of them is that uh, humans are very visual. And so a visual mirror test makes sense for humans. And you've just informed me that it makes sense for humans older than two. Is that correct? Correct. Right. right. So Not that makes sense for, uh, for us folks. And naturally we project our own concepts of consciousness into whatever we're studying. Uh, so, so the mirror test was very appealing uh, at a time when, in a sense, people had forgotten uh, two centuries of sensory psychophysics. Because the word psychophysics, of course, as you know, it means mind body. Uh, and Fechner's uh, belief at the time, Fechner was a very good physicist, uh, his belief at the time that the relationship, the very regular logarithmic relationship between physical sensory input and subjective uh, reports uh, and using a variety of methods, that that logarithmic relationship proved or should prove to every sensible person in the world that there is no mind-body separation because they, they have such a wonderful uh, mathematical relationship to each other in terms of sensory intensities, at least. Well, that's the traditional view. And, and the word empirical, in fact, uh, historically, if I forgot my history of philosophy correct, historically empirical meant sensory consciousness. Uh, 
and if you talk to the you know the average guy uh, uh, working on, on on the frozen windmills in Texas today, and you ask them about uh, consciousness, they won't know what the puzzle is because they use consciousness every single moment of their working lives and they better do that because otherwise they're going to get hurt and they know that perfectly well so so there is this gulf between uh, intellectual philosophers who don't talk to enough plumbers uh, <laughs> and the rest of the practical world uh, where sensory consciousness by itself as long as you can accurately point to it uh, or describe it in words if you're going to be fancy about it, but a simple pointing test and a simple match-mismatch uh, test, which animals can do, uh, is essentially the, uh, the accurate descriptive, uh, description criterion. Uh, it should be actually a, a voluntary description criterion of consciousness. And that's what uh, Fechner and the gang uh, used for since 1800 or so. So, so this is very strange golf, which I blame on the philosophers because they like being blamed since, uh, since they're basically doing a rhetorical uh, act uh, and they just love to argue. Um, and, and I don't, you know, I love to argue up to a point, but then I get frustrated uh, when they seem to be making the same argument over and over again. So this is my public complaint against my friends like David Chalmers and Dan Dennett and, and so on, um, who are extremely brilliant. <clears throat> and um, they have been brought up, not their fault, by the way, in an Anglo-American tradition of anti empirical or non-empirical philosophy. Uh, that got started with Bertrand Russell, who I think was guilty uh, of introducing that to his immense influence uh, in the English speaking world. And it was Bertrand Russell who celebrated John B. Watson's first book in the British press. And that made Watson a world figure and it made radical behaviorism respectable. Uh, so, so that's a very, very strange phenomenon uh, uh, in human history. But science does have taboos, just like other human groups. We have our taboos. Uh, and sometimes uh, we get into terrible trouble because of our taboos. So, Bernie, um... We better wind things up, I'm afraid. Yes, uh, uh, we've been I, I, this on is for, fun. This is so much fun. We have to get you back. Um, and I want to thank you so much. And I also want to um, mention to the audience um, that David Chalmers, he will be coming soon. We're, we're probably going to get him out here in person. And I've invited oh, Dan great. Bennett as well, who is also very excited about the center. So they can defend themselves. Although Absolutely. Dennett... Dennett adopts your theory of consciousness, mind you. And he, he's sick of philosophers too. But um, anyway, we just had such a great time. And um, let's see, I want to announce our next events just very briefly. Um, so, and if you want to learn more about Bernie's views, do read his wonderful book. It's only 650 pages. Yeah, it's a snap. Uh, but I, I'm reading it by the pool. I mean, it is a real terrifically <laughs> accessible read. I mean, I'm, it's a blast. Um, so the next event is um, joint with the Brain Institute at FAU. And we're bringing in our own Elan Barinholtz as well as the famous Jill Tarter, the woman who inspired the film Contact, uh, the Carl Sagan film slash novel, um, to talk about alien intelligence, what it would be like, and whether there would be convergent evolution, um, you know, what, what do brains need to have to get to the level at which, you know, they create things like intel, uh, create civilizations, for example. Um, so it will be speculative, but it will be much fun. And that's joint with the Brain Institute. 
And then after that, we have Stuart Russell on um, AI safety. Bernie, you should come because you and I have had some really fun discussions about artificial intelligence. I know you have your, your worries. We didn't even get to these. Um, but, you know, Stuart is um, the author of this wonderful book called Human Compatible on AI safety, as well as the, I don't know how many of you saw the Slaughterbots videos on drone safety, which are, you know, very frightening, um, highly recommended, mm -hmm. but very frightening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks for coming today, everybody. And Bernie, thank you so much for your time and for, you know, being so incredibly informative well, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I really appreciate this. And I think this is one of the first uh, talks or, or Q and A's uh, that I've had where everybody was able to ask these deadly questions, uh, which I have tried to field and we'll see where all that goes. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. Great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.